It's only been a couple of weeks since we've had our last in the mail, but items have been gathering in the mailbag bin and these are items that I need to start using right away. I'm also sure many of my viewers enjoy these videos judging by the highest number of views they get when compared to my other videos, so I don't think uh, many people would complain about having too many mailbag videos. I'm gonna start the video with this uh, CC1101 based module. And this has to be one of the most uh, popular sub 1 GHz radio chips out there. Uh, it's been on the market for at least 10 years, but it's still an active part. Uh, Texas Instruments even released a pin-to-pin -pin compatible lower cost version called CC11OL, uh, which uh, lost some of its features uh, just to make it cheaper. And my plan is to try and connect this to something like an ESP32 and depending on firmware support, choose one of the popular platforms like uh, Tasmota, ESP Home or OpenMQTT Gateway or other uh, such uh, firmware packages to create an RF bridge to Home Assistant. And this way I could capture uh, signals that are emitted by you know, stuff like my smoke detectors which have a built-in radio signaling option. So this little module should help me experiment with that. But of course, there are many other possibilities like remote controls, uh, RF remote controls. The sponsor of this video is PCBWay.com, a professional PCB manufacturer with excellent quality and fast turnaround times. From two layers to advanced multi-layer flex rigid PCBs, PCBWay will have you covered. You could also try them out for many of their other services like 3D printing, CNC machining and manufacturing services in general. Check out their website linked below. Next up I have a couple of charging modules, uh, but we all know the famous TP4056 linear charging IC for lithium polymer batteries, it's 5 volt, 1 amp. Some boards come with battery protection IC plus MOSFET, some without like I have here, but they all had this um, a mini USB connector in, the, in, the, in their first revisions, then they switched to micro USB. And well, it's about time we see an upgrade to at least just using a newer USB Type-C connector, if not a better a newer IC. So I found these two options on uh, AliExpress. This first one is based on the TP4057, which is set for one amp charging current, uh, same linear charging technology. And as far as I can tell, there is no obvious difference between the TP4056 and TP4057. Might even be just a rebadged TP4056 chip in here, or maybe a different company that makes it. Additionally, there seems to be uh, another chip on this board, uh, which is in charge of the battery protection circuitry in that SOT 235 package. And uh, this chip is labeled MKF2L. No results show up on a Google search, but uh, it must be integrating both the uh, MOSFETs and the protection circuit into this tiny package. The second module I have is a bit more interesting and it's based on a different chip. It's a switch mode this time given the inductor and this chip has a dual function. It can charge the battery at up to 1.2 amps from the 5 volt USB input but it can also boost the single cell voltage to 5 volts at up to 1.2 amps output while also offering protection features for the battery. And it's amazing how these Chinese manufacturers develop their own silicon and integrate all of the desired functionality in just a tiny SOT23 uh, chip. And also very importantly, something you would want to check when ordering such USB-C modules is if they have the CC line resistors on board, the 5.1 kilo ohm resistors. And these modules both feature those resistors which ensure adequate signaling to the upstream device to enable the correct voltage on the port. So these could be pretty handy. In fact, I think I'm going to order a set of five pieces because they, they are very cheap. And second, because I tend to use one of these whenever I have to build like a quick project or prototype involving a single cell lithium battery. As usual, there will be links for all the products shown in this video in the description below the video. Next up, I have a couple of uh, USB Type-C adapters because I found myself needing these uh, lately. So one of them is to adapt from USB Type-C to USB Type-A. Another one is uh, the other way around. And these ports are rated for USB 3.0 data rates and up to 3 amps of uh, current, presumably on 5 volts. So that would give you a 15 watts rating for these connectors. They seem to be of decent quality. Uh, but I would not push these over their limits in general in terms of uh, you know data rate or maximum power. Uh, one thing I wish these had is some kind of you know lanyard attachment eye so that I could keep them together to avoid the losing one or the other. Uh, but 
I also guess I could just stick them one into the other and store them like this. Next up in the wiring department, I felt the need for using, you know, thinner wires for, for when I have to quickly put together a prototype of some microcontroller board plus some sensor to quickly test something. But uh, not only thin wires, but also multiple cars, because I had, for example, this kit of uh, silicon wires, uh, and these were 30 AWG. And uh, I had you know, five different uh, color options in here, but recently uh, I had to wire you know, more than 10 wires between two modules. So I wanted to have a bit more options in terms of colors so I don't have to uh, repeat so many of the colors. So I, I got this set as well, which um, brings in a, a set of five new colors. And I opted for 10 meters uh, each, uh, of the on each of the spools. Uh, which is plenty for me but i believe there are other options uh, other length options that you can choose from so uh, if you need like higher quantity you can uh, go for those one thing i noticed is that even though they are both awg 30 the new uh, silicon wire kit is much thinner than the old one so generally i prefer thinner uh, insulation just because i'm working with low voltages you know maximum five volts most of the times so i don't need uh, you know thick insulation on my wires I also got some PVC insulation wire. This is UL1571, 30 volts rated, seven strands of wire inside, a 0.9 millimeter outer diameter. And it seems to be just about the same thickness as these silicon wires. But of course, the previous ones that I had are much uh, thicker. I have eight different uh, colors in here, which is going to be helpful. Uh, but unfortunately, these don't come as a kit on spools. So I'm just going to keep them in a Ziploc bag. And this is really useful for wiring stuff, building prototypes, etc. Like I said, I would recommend getting as many color options as possible. Next up, I got a couple of these one meter long USB type C extension cables. So you get the female connector on one end with a male connector on the other end. And the plan was for me to use these to extend my um, watch and phone wireless charging pads just a little bit to a different wall socket, freeing up my nightstand socket. And while these might still do the job, I'm not too happy with them. Uh, they're a bit on the thick and stiff side, and that is because they are rated for USB 3.1, 10 gigabits per second, and 100 watts power delivery. Then there is this braiding sleeving, which also increases the thickness. And in my case, just the standard USB 2.0 data pair plus some 15 watts power rating would have been enough for extending my charging pads. But like I said, these uh, will be hidden away, so they will still do the job. Next up, I got a couple of these uh, short angled mains power cables. And I believe the model number on these is IEC C7, basically the uh, European uh, two pin power cable that you usually get with a TV or a uh, sound set or some other low power double insulated device, which doesn't need a ground connection. And why do I need these? Well, it's very simple. When I designed the electrical wiring for my apartment, I placed the sockets with consideration for the uh, spots where I plan to later install certain furniture and electronics. And now I ended up with the um, default power cables that the electronics like a TV set or a sound bar included, which are, you know, two meters long and they're all coiled up behind the unit, which has the socket right behind it. And that's not nice. So a, a short power cable like this one makes for a much neater install. It even has the right angle bend, so it doesn't stick out from the socket as much and it can go right into the device. Next up, I got this two meter long RG58 cable, which is uh, terminated with an SMA uh, male connector on one end and an N-type connector on the other end. Pretty obvious that this is supposed to connect to some kind of equipment or an, an antenna. So I've recently started playing with LoRa devices on the LoRa One network specifically. And I'm at a uh, phase where I'm learning how things interconnect. I'm building DIY nodes, I'm installing a gateway, and there should be some videos coming up on the subject. Uh, but I need to be stocking up on some bits and pieces that would allow me to connect various antennas to my gateway to uh, do some range testing. And I also got this N-type connector with a female middle pin, which is required for connection to an antenna I'm going to show next. And this is just in case I want to wire my own RG58 cable, I could use this connector and build my own cable. And surprisingly, this product seems to have a, you know, a label with some information on it. And the listing on AliExpress does offer additional info like mechanical drawing, the frequency range and all sorts of other useful parameters. 
Next up I got this uh, bad boy of an uh, antenna which uh, doesn't quite fit in the frame because it's a 55 centimeter long uh, rated for 868 915 MHz frequency band antenna and this covers my needs for the frequency of 868 MHz for LoRa in the EU. Uh, antenna comes from AliExpress from a company named Star RF, so I'm not too sure it will meet all the specs, but they claim you know 10 to 12 dBi gain. SWR of equal or greater than 1.3, so that would put it right in the middle of the desired range if it matches. It's got this uh, male um, N-type connector. And I have to say the build quality feels uh, pretty nice. It, the ends are you know, sealed with some silicone. There's this strong metal base which can be used for mechanically attaching this to a post. And I plan to use my Nano VNA to do some measurements on this antenna to test for its center frequency as well as SWR and compare it with other options. So there will be a future video on this topic. And uh, here's a quick tip. Whenever I receive antennas, I just like to either put a label or write on it with a marker to have at least the center frequency and part number available for future reference. I also got its uh, little brother which is uh, 37 centimeters long and this one also claims 12 dBi of gain but comes from a different uh, no-name company or supplier. The SWR is less than or equal to 1.5 and it comes with a uh, male uh, SMA connector. No brand name, no idea if it meets the spec, very little spec given at all on the AliExpress listing. Uh, but I will be measuring this one as well to get a feel of at least its center frequency and uh, SWR. It most likely won't be meeting uh, the exact specs they give. Recently I got myself a J-Link uh, Edu version because I just wanted a reliable platform to use for my hobby projects for whenever I have to flash or debug ARM microcontrollers. And I also do have the uh, ST-Link V3, which I use for STM devices, but recently when I started the project on the Nordic NRF 52840, I had to resort to using their uh, dev board, which includes the programmer, the J-Link programmer to uh, flash my target board, which is not very convenient. Um, I, I think an ST-Link V3 could be used, but maybe not with the default, you know, tool chain from Nordic. So now I had this need for this new programmer to adapt its uh, connector to various other pinouts and sizes. Hence why I got this adapter from um, AliExpress. It's very cheap to get one, so well worth keeping in my toolbox. And uh, don't forget, there are links for all of these items in the description below. Next up, I got a few special screwdriver bits. And these two are for electrical work. And we typically use SLPZ here in the EU for screws found on MCBs and similar electrical equipment. But these ones that I got are actually called FPH2 or FPH, uh, you know, and the number denotes the size of the bit. Now, I'm, I'm pretty sure this is not commonly found on, on European equipment. Uh, it's just a combination between slotted and um, Philips. So maybe SLPH would be a better name. And I, I just saw the picture and ordered them without actually checking this because they are not my, you know, intended SLPZ that I wanted. But luckily, there is also the POSI options, which they are calling FPZ. And I will link those in the description below so that you can order those directly because, you know, I just realized uh, this when I got them. So I had to place a second order and... Now I'll just be having uh, both options. Next up, I also got a set of these, which I found interesting. And these are the security type bits that you might find on you know, various uh, products designed to prevent the average user from opening the device. But we are not average users, right? So we use the right bits to open even the most uh, unexpected screw. And you never know when you'll use these, but when you do come across one of the, those screws, you'll thank me for ordering one of these. Next up, I ordered myself one of these tools, which is listed as Smart Electric Sharpening Pen. And I mean, it, this must be a translation error, but ultimately this is, you know, a high speed uh, rotating tool. Uh, I'm not sure yet, but we'll, we'll see it in, in a few moments. It should be battery powered, should offer different speeds, adjustments, and it can be used for fine engraving. Or in my case, I intend to use it for you know, scraping away solder mask or other resins from the surface of a PCB during repairs. And I'm sure I'm not the only one that constantly is using you know, the wrong tool for the job. And this includes the soldering iron tip, fine tweezers, which ultimately damage those uh, because 
I'm using them for the wrong tasks. So I decided to get a better tool for the job. Let's see how this guy works. Uh, it has a USB Type-C port for charging, which is very nice. It's pretty slim and lightweight. So uh, yeah, let me install one of the provided uh, cutting uh, bits and see it in action. So the tool actually has uh, three different speeds that you can uh, switch through with this button. And it's actually very effective at, you know, removing solder mask from the PCB. Now, one thing that I would be worried about is, you know, removing even the copper itself. So you'd have to get a feel for this, use it a couple of times until you get, you know, the right pressure to apply on the PCB for the uh, desired removal of the solder mask. But yep, it's actually quite effective and I guess it could also be used for engraving purposes. But in my case, I'll just be using it for, you know, rework tasks on PCBs. And I'm quite happy with uh, the job it does. It wasn't too expensive either. So yeah, I can recommend getting one of these if you do PCB repairing. Next up, here is a new model of a syringe booster thingy because uh, I have been using a bunch of different models so far and this one has been my you know, favorite for solder paste syringe because it just provides this uh, lever to amplify the force um, and it was fairly cheap to get but at some point the paste uh, becomes more viscous uh, because it dries up and so the poor little plastic handle um, just can't take the force very well um, anymore and you know it starts to crack on the weak point so sooner or later this will uh, fail now this uh, newer model from real life seems to be a lot more sturdy so let me install this on the syringe and uh, see how it behaves it even has the you know uh, needle holders on the side which is very nice Yeah, so th this one feels nicer. It doesn't necessarily offer you a um, higher lever effect. So it applies about the same force as the um, old device, but it just feels a lot more solid uh, when you press this lever. And there's, of, of course, the latching mechanism, uh, which keeps the, the plunger pressed on the syringe. So it's a much nicer device, but yes, it does feel heavier and it is a bit more expensive but if you want something reliable more reliable than the this simple one you have to go for the more expensive option at least for the more viscous stuff like the solder paste for the flux syringes i don't even use one of these boosters flux oozes out of the syringe pretty easy so i don't even need a booster for that and the last item in today's video is uh, this type of flume wrench which is really useful for sync faucet type installments where you have this um, rather tight space around the water supply lines, which makes it very difficult to insert any other kind of wrench in that space. Of course, you shouldn't use too much force on those. Maybe they're even designed to be hand tightened. I don't know for sure, but I can tell you that I've done some work around my home and I've always wanted to have one of these to make my life easier. Uh, sometimes uh, a nut might just be stuck and you might be using this to uh, get it undone. And I'll just include some pictures from the AliExpress listing on screen to better illustrate what I mean. They have a few different models you can choose from. Uh, this one, I believe, is the 8-in-1 model, which uh, is going to be very useful in my toolbox. It also comes with these um, optional adapters and these two guys, which don't know how I would use these, uh, but, you know, the main the main operation for which I would use this is already included in the main tool. So that was all for today. Lots of interesting items in here, at least for me. And I would be curious to see if you found something interesting to order in this video. Let me know in the comments below. Same as always, links for all of the products shown here will be placed in the description below the video. So do check them out. Thank you for watching this video. Don't forget you can support the channel on Patreon with as little as $1 per month. Or you can simply hit that like button, which is free but helps a lot. I'll be seeing you next week.